Hello everybody, thank you first of all for coming along today. Today I will talk about uh, developing a machine learning model from scratch and then how to deploy it for production. Uh, I would also like to say if you have any questions during the presentation just feel free to raise your hand, we will stop and explain everything because maybe it will be a bit complicated at some point. I will start with the famous field, uh, first you can see. I will start with a famous quote from Hans Moravec, known as the Moravec Paradox, which says that it is comparatively easy to make computers exhibit adult-level performance on intelligence tests or playing checkers, and difficult or impossible to give them the skills of a one-year-old when it comes to perception and mobility. If you think about it, it's quite logical, actually. If you want to build a checkers game, we don't have any obstacles. We, know, we already know the rules of the checkers. We just develop the algorithm and everything works. But what if we have as input an image which has a handwritten digit on it and we want, to, uh, we want an algorithm which recognizes the digit on, on the input image? From scratch, uh, without knowing any computer vision from scratch, we will think about some rules. If there is a 10 by 10 pixel in, on the middle of the image, it might be a zero. Or if there is a half circle on the bottom of the image, it might be a nine, but it also might be an eight. So as you can see, the rules start to become complex and probably infinitely many rules. We couldn't write all of them and the algorithm would be just crap. But we have a solution, artificial neural networks or ANNs shortly. The reason why these might work because they, is that they process the data uh, how our brain processes the data. Let's take a look first at a simple biological neuron because this was the base of the whole artificial neural network field. Our brain has hundreds of millions of neurons and they pass electromagnetic electromagnetic impulses from one another until they have an output. A simple one neuron receives an impulse from, uh, through the dendrites. The nucleus uh, sums these impulses and then if uh, the sum uh, exceeds a, a firing threshold, then our neuron will fire and through, through its axon it will send another impulse to the next neurons which are connected through the axon terminal. This sounds quite easy and based on this theory in 1943 Warren McCulloch and Walter Pitts developed an artificial neural, net, an artificial neural model which is called the threshold logic unit. As you can see it's the same as a biological neuron. It, uh, the dendrites now are the inputs uh, in addition, we have weights because uh, we want because not every input contributes in the same manner to our output. Uh, the weighted sum then is computed uh, in the activation part, and we use an activation function, which in our case here and the first activation function was a heavy side function, uh, which works like this: if the sum computed is greater than a threshold, then the output will be 1. If not, the output will be 0. Later, scientists realized that this threshold logic unit is not able to solve nonlinear problems. As you can see on the left, there is a clear, you can see that it's a linearly separable problem. We can find a line, a hyperplane, which separates the two classes. But the one on the right, it's not linearly separable. This problem led to an AI winter of about 20 years when scientists realized that if you stack more neural net, more artificial neurons together, you can solve nonlinear problems. And this resulted in artificial neural networks. In an artificial neural network, the first layer is the input layer. The last one is the output layer where we uh, have our predictions. It can be as many as as many as many categories we have and everything in between are hidden layers. One, now that we have the basics, 
let's focus on our main topic, which is convolutional neural networks, or CNNs. CNNs, they are not so scary as, it, as they might sound. They are basically artificial neural networks, but they have an additional type of layer, which is the convolutional layer. They are, uh, uh, CNNs are well known because of their use in image recognition, especially from 2012, when Alex Przeski and his team uh, won that year's ImageNet competition, which is basically the annual Olympics for computer vision. They managed to drop the classification error from 26% to 15%, which back then was a huge achievement. Nowadays, the classification error, error is below 1%. Uh, today, I will show an example of a CNN uh, for classifying handwritten digits. Here, you can see a very simple architecture of a CNN. As I said, we have an input image. It is passed through a series of convolutional layers, nonlinear layers, and uh, pooling layers. Then they are flattened and connected to uh, an artificial neural network. And uh, at, uh, on the output layer, we will, we will receive the output probabilities. We will talk in, in a bit of details about each layer, because I think it's really important to know what happens behind the scenes because with uh, today's Python libraries, for example, anybody can, be, can build a machine learning model. But the difference between a good model and a really good model is parameter tuning, which cannot be done if you don't know how your model really works. So the first layer in the CNN is always a convolutional layer. One important thing to know is your input dimension. Uh, in our case, for images, is the width, the height, and the color channel. Uh, for classifying handwritten digits, since the image is grayscale, the color channel will be 1, but usually when we have uh, colored images, the RGB is 3, so the color channel will be 3. Uh, how you can think about a convolutional layer? Just imagine a flashlight shining over in the beginning, shining over the left top corner of your image. And then you, you keep sliding over your image until you cover all the region. The, shine, the part which shines, the flashlight is named in, in the CNN language, the filter. And the region where the flashlight shines on the real image is is named the receptive field. One important thing to note that, for example, uh, if we have a colored image and uh, the depth of the vector of the image is 3, then the depth of the filter should also be 3. So how this basically works? It slides, the filter slides uh, through the image. It computes the, uh, the sum, the the, the multiplication first between the filter and the pixel values and then adds them up and uh, computes a number. The number computed at, at the top left of the image is our first uh, value of the resulting activation map. We have to perform this multiplication and addition for each uh, field for each receptive field of the image. For example, uh, in our case, we will have a 28 by 28 image, and we will result in a 26 by 26 activation map because there are uh, 26 uh, multiplied by 26 is 676, and there are 676 places where our filter or flashlight can shine. So it's really important. And this uh, activation map, which is the result of the convolution, will represent the input to our next layer, we will see, which we will see which is the next one. Also note that we can use more filters. And the, the more filters we use, the more information we can extract from the images. 
And also, it's really important that uh, in the first convolutional layer, when we start our process, to use small filter sizes, which means 2 by 2 or 3 by 3. Uh, and this is because we can ex extract more low-level information. In the case of, uh, image, uh, of ImageNet, which I, in 2012, Alex Przeski used an 11 by 11 filter uh, size in the first convolutional layer, and then on, in the next year, the winner used a 7x7 filter size with the same architecture, and they had a better uh, accuracy. So it's really important to use smaller filters in the first convolutional layer. The next layer is a nonlinear, or nowadays called ReLU layer, which is a rectified linear unit layer. Uh, basically, this is used for introducing nonlinearity because in the previous la layer we only performed uh, linear functions, addition, multiplication. Uh, the rectified linear unit function basically just computes the maximum value of between zero and the uh, value taken. This means that we eliminate all the negative values from our activation map. In the past, uh, scientists used the sigmoid function, but uh, they realized that the rectified linear unit performs much better and uh, they can train the network faster without losing accuracy. Uh, I recommend, if you are interested, I would recommend reading a paper why rectified linear unit functions are better than sigmoids by Jeffrey Hinton, Rectified Linear Units Improve Restricted Boltzmann Machines. So, if you want just to note it. The next layer, it's optional, it's not compulsory, is the pooling layer. There are different types of pooling layers, like average pooling or max pooling, but from all of them, max pooling is the most popular. This basically uses a 2x2 two two filter and with step size 2. And you have to take care here the pooling filter is applied for each activation map. It's not, it, it doesn't work like the convolutional uh, filter that it has to have the depth of the input. The, the pooling has only depth one and it performs the pooling for each activation map. How it works, it just slides through the image, but now note that it uh, doesn't slide on the same uh, pixel twice. And it takes the maximum value, since we use max pooling, and computes the activation map of the pooling layer. Why should we use pooling layers? First of all, once we detected a feature and we know its location, it's not important to know its exact location. It's enough to know its relative location to other features detected. So this way, we can re reduce the size uh, a lot, and uh, so the number of parameters is less than with 75%. And also, if you use pooling layers, we can control overfitting of our model. Overfitting means that our model performs really well on the training set, but when we uh, want to predict on new data, it performs poorly. Until now, we detected edges, curves, and basically information from our image. Now, we want to attach it to a fully connected artificial neural network. To do this, first of all, we have to flatten our 2x2 uh, two two matrix, which is the image, not 2x2, two two, n by n matrix, which is our image. We have to flatten it, and then just attach it to a fully connected a neural network where the input layer will be our uh, image or lots of activation maps flattened. We, it will pass through the network and in the end we will have the probabilities of which category is recognized. So basically this is it about the layers used in a convolutional neural network. Now uh, you might wonder, why is it working? How is the model uh, recognizing features? 
you have to know that uh, the numbers in the in every filter are randomly initialized in the beginning and then using an algorithm called backpropagation they manage to update those numbers which are also called weights and each filter will be able to detect its own features. Backpropagation back has four stages. Forward pass, when uh, we pass the input through our network and we have an output. We have a loss function, where if our output doesn't match with the expected output, we will calculate some loss between them. For example, if we we can use the squared distance between the pixels of uh, the the square distance between the resulted category and the expected category then using backward pass and this is done by heavy mathematics uh, first order derivative functions will be calculated and le le lastly all the weights will be updated weights are through the uh, fully connected networks, weights are at the filters. Each filter, each pixel of the filter has a weight. So these will be updated. I will not go into more detail about backpropagation, but if you are interested, you can read a paper by Jan Lekun, Efficient Backpropagation, uh, and he explains it really well. We have our model. But we want, we want our model, we want our users to use the model. We couldn't tell them to open the terminal because not everybody knows how to open the terminal or pre-process an image so it is ready to be passed into a convolutional neural network. For this reason, we have to connect it to a UI usually. Uh, in, in this case, I connected my model to a Flask web app. Uh, I, read, I read about Django and Flask, which would be better to use, and I ended up using Flask because it's, it's really easy to use it and it, it uh, gives you free hands, so you can just in, initialize your model and use it immediately. Uh, I will walk through the code now, just, just to see how we build uh, CNN in Python. Okay, so um, this is First of all, we import a few libraries. Uh, for those who don't know, matplotlib is for uh, plotting data. Uh, NumPy is for performing mathematical operations. Then I chose Keras as a library. Keras is basically built on top of TensorFlow and it's probably easier if you don't want to perform computation directly on the GPU, probably it's easier to use Keras because it's the same as TensorFlow. Then I defined a few uh, variables where batch, si uh, batch size means the number of training examples taken, uh, taken and after the number of uh, training ex examples passed through, we performed the update. So we passed through the network 128 images, we compute the loss, and only after that we will uh, perform the weight update. The number of classes is that we have basically 10 output classes zero, from 0 to 9. And the epochs, how many times you want to go through the uh, training set. The dimensions of our image will be 28 by 28. Uh, and we will use the NIST data set, which was uh, gathered quite a long time ago, but it's still quite popular data set, and Keras provides it. As I, uh, here you can see that we have 60,000 images in our training set, and each is 28 by 28. 
For example, the first image is a 5. Then we need to perform a few reshapings and uh, in order to be able to use the convolutional layers because they take an array of, uh, as we spoke, an array of, uh, of uh, widths, heights and then the color channel in the end. Uh, we use, we transform our numbers to floating type and uh, we scale all our numbers so from so uh, it's really important for artificial neural networks uh, that their inputs are uh, in the same scale because otherwise one type of input will outweigh the other and we don't want that because it performs mathematical functions. Um, we cannot leave our output to be 0 or 1 or 2. So our output layer will have basically 10 nodes. And each node in the end will contain a probability of whether it's a 0, it's a 1, it's a 2. So we have to transform our um, expected output which for now just contains numbers between 0 and 9, to uh, categorical variables, uh, for, which means that, for example, for, uh, for a 7, we will have uh, zeros on the place of 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. On the 7th place, we will have a 1, and on the 8th and on the 9th place, we will have a 0. And this will represent basically number 7 in our case. In Keras, you initialize your model using the sequential class. Then we add two convolutional layers uh, and we specify the kernel size, which is basically the filter size. I use three by three filters in both. Uh, as activations, um, it, it has it performs also the nonlinear functions. I use the ReLU nonlinear function. Then we add a pooling layer. Uh, this is a max pooling layer, and we use a filter size of 2 by 2. Once we pooled it, uh, then we can add a flattening layer, which basically flattens our image. And in the end, we add uh, our neural network, artificial neural network. Uh, here we use the dense classes, which basically just add layers of uh, how many nodes we want. In the, in the beginning, I added 128 nodes. Uh, you can choose the number of nodes by calculating uh, it's advised to, to choose the number of nodes by calculating how many nodes you have in the previous layer, add to that the number of output nodes, and divide by two. This is a convention I found. And then the last dense function is our activation function, uh, our output uh, layer. And as activation function, we use the softmax function. Uh, we use the softmax instead of sigmoid, but uh, each of them pro uh, computes probabilities. But the difference is that with softmax functions, we, we can be sure that in the end, when, when we add all the probabilities, it will sum to 1, because the formula is working like that. <coughs> Once we constructed our uh, network, we can compile it. I will not compile it now because it will take some time. Uh, and once it's compiled, we will start to fit it on our training data first. And uh, then we will also have validation data, which, um, which we will measure the accuracy on, the, on new data. Usually it's convenient to save our model once we train it because for a Probably this might take like six hours to train, so we don't want to wait at every prediction to train it for six hours and then make one prediction or something like that. So we save it to a file. I already saved it, so I will load it now from file. 
and we can evaluate our model by calling the evaluate function and uh, specifying the uh, test data. You can see that even though it's a really simple um, architecture, it performs really well, 99%. This can still be improved. Nowadays, uh, record is like 99.7% accuracy. Also, if we want to make a prediction, we can just use the predict method, but we have, uh, we have to take care of our, our input shape. Here, known basically defines the number of images for which we want to make a prediction, and then 28 by 28 by one, which we talked about. Yeah, and as an example, you can see that th uh, this is the image we made prediction on. Uh, we want to predict a seven, and here, uh, we have to find a prediction like this because in the in the pred we basically receive an array of probabilities which i told you about uh, 10 probabilities and we can we have to see which is the biggest one and that that is our result basically which is a 7 okay I have some good news. We are halfway through the battle, just halfway. And the other part is quite an overdue battle, honestly. Until now, we have been thinking all like data scientists. We built our model, we didn't care about naming the variables, nothing, just making sure that our algorithm works. But to uh, put our model to production, we have to think like data engineers and apply our software engineering skills from naming variables to uh, making unit tests to logging everything until our model is ready to be implemented in a bigger software. Uh, today I will talk about a really simple deployment strategy using Docker. Why Docker? Because it allows us to package all our dependencies into one container. And I like to say that a container, I like to think about a container like a lightweight virtual machine. But basically, you can package in this container everything, including your operating system. So you can forget about dependency hell, which means that if it runs somewhere, you can be sure that it, it will run everywhere. How you can do this? It's quite simple actually. You have to create a Docker file in which you configure your Docker container and a requirements file where you will list all your dependencies for your project. I listed also another file, docker run.avs, because uh, in my case I deployed uh, this container to AWS through Elastic Beanstalk. Beanstalk, it was really, really easy. I just had to package my files and upload it and everything worked, but they needed this docker run.avs. I will show you now how to do it for those who are unfamiliar with docker. First of all, our docker file. Uh, there exists so-called docker hub, which is like github, uh, but you can upload Docker images there. Uh, and they, the people from Docker also created their original images for everything, Python, Java, basically everything. So I imported an image from them, the Python 3 image. Then since uh, it's a web app, I had to expose a port. I exposed port 5000. Using the copy uh, method, copy a command. I copied all my files from the SRC folder where basically it's my Flask app. I copied it into a new directory in the container 
uh, also src and I, I set it that directory as the working directory and then executing the command python app.py which is like typing it in the terminal it will start running my app everything is perfect the requirements text file here I listed all the requirements that I need in order that my app will run smoothly without problems. I needed TensorFlow, obviously, because Keras is using TensorFlow as a backend. I needed NumPy, Flask, Scikit-Learn, and H5Py. This is when you want to exp uh, when, you, when you want to save your uh, model to disk. You save it into into a .h5 file. So you needed this too. In addition, this is uh, you can find this also in, on. Uh, AWS document in AWS documentation this is their convention to upload a JSON file and with data about your docker with, uh, the important part is just specifying here your image name so how you can do all this First of all, you have to navigate to your directory where you have all your files. And then you have to build a Docker. First of all, you have to start Docker. You have to install it on your PC and start it so the Docker server is running. Once that is done, you have to navigate to your root directory. Just a second. Yeah, once you are in your root directory, you have to build an image. You've specified your Docker file or your requirements text file. Now you have to build that image. You do it by running Docker build. You have to specify a tag name, which is a convenience to use your user, your Docker root username, slash, and the name you want to give to your container. And in the end, you, have, you also have to specify the path of the directory uh, you are working with. In our case, it's just the current directory. Once you are done with building your image, you can run your image. We have to specify the port because we are exposing one. and the image name. And now basically it will execute the app.py file and my uh, Flask web app will run and we will be able to access it from the browser. So it's running, and if you want to check it out, here we have a digit classifier. Uh, I just put a canvas there where we can draw any digit and if you want to recognize it it will recognize we can clear we can try anything uh, that's it for running your container and now if we want to deploy it for example to AWS where, our where, where I deployed it First, we have to upload it to Docker Hub because they are uh, pulling it from Docker Hub, basically. All you have to do is type docker push and 
and your image name and it will be uploaded to Docker Hub. Anybody can pull it, can use it and it will run everywhere. That's the great thing about it. Uh, by the time I will just show you how simple it is to use your model in Flask. All you have to do is just load your model from uh, from file once it's trained, and then by defining two API points, you can uh, you can receive your image. I wrote a, I wrote a few functions to get the image from the canvas. And then using the classify, uh, first you have to do some reshapings in order to have the same shape as the convolutional network is expecting. And then you just have to make the prediction and return it. So it's really simple to use it in Flask. Okay. This was a really, really simple deployment strategy. There are certainly more advanced ones. I would suggest watching a video from PyData Amsterdam 2017 by Niels Zeilmarker. He is talking about a really nice deployment strategy based on DTAP, which means deployment, testing, acceptance, and uh, publishing for each uh, process it uses different containers using docker and the containers are managed by kubernetes but obviously it's more complex than i just said now this is just uh, the main point of it thank you any questions it will fail. It will fail from the prediction initially. Yeah, I can. I can run it. The thing will be that uh, when you type something else in the output, your probabilities will be almost equally uh, distributed. So you will just get the wrong prediction. Which is Or it fails. No. And if you draw a file, in, a small file in the right corner, it will recognize. Yeah, it's because because of the layers you use, the convolutional one and the pooling layer, especially. It doesn't matter where your um, your digit is placed. And also in the training set, uh, digits are placed everywhere, so it's well trained and it looks for features, not for the location of the features. That's why I said that if you use pooling layers, it's not important where your features are. It's important their relative location to other features, so it will recognize. What if you draw two numbers? I one bigger and one smaller. Oh. It depends. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, there is a research going on uh, if you want to find multiple numbers then basically 
you have to take, you first define a certain dimension and then you take parts of the image, basically slide through the image, take each part, and first you try to identify a separator between two digits. So your first model will be trained so that it will see that there are two digits and there is a separator. Once it finds that, it will separate those two parts and then you will again run sliding through all that part and uh, try to find a digit with the highest probability. So this way it will. Would that work if you draw a big A and inside a circle of A draw a two? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure. Anyways, this is not recognizing uh, two digits on the same canvas because it doesn't have that other model which finds a splitting between two different digits. So I'm not really quite a new in what we have in machine learning. Can you give us some other example of this can be uh, application where you can use uh, machine learning and this kind of libraries? Yeah, for example, there are different types of machine learning. Super, supervised learning, unsuper, unsupervised learning, and reinforcement learning. Supervised is when we know the expected output, so we train our machine learning model so that it will find a function which can predict uh, the outputs as accurately as possible, and we have some expected output with which to compare. And with unsupervised learning, we have to find some trends in the data. For example, uh, unsupervised learning could be used if we would like to find some trends uh, in a shop, in, uh, in our customer base. I remember reading a blog post probably like two years ago that uh, scientists saw that in Lidl, I think, the trend was that uh, men between the age of 25 and 45 are usually buying pampers and beer in the same time, like together. So machine learning found this trend. How do you know the age of them? Uh, you, know, you know the data about your, uh, you know, you have the input data. And they probably did some surveys or something like that. So they collected data, they didn't know the output, so it was unsupervised learning, and they used, uh, for example, this is k-means clustering, to try to find clusters of customers. So they found a cluster which is buying pampers and beer almost every time, so something like that. So basically the, the machine learning was telling, was telling them what was, bought, what was bought the most in that category of, uh, of people or they were looking for those categories of uh, products? No, that so uh, think about you have all the input data which is probably collected through a survey. You can uh, plot this data which will be simply in a two-dimensional space, a lot of points. And maybe there is, let me scroll there, Yeah, so maybe there are uh, points, don't take account of the colors, random points. And we uh, tell the machine learning model, which we might use a K and N for the left picture, a K means clustering, to uh, try to find those clusters. This is a specific uh, mathematical algorithm which specifies clusters and they will jump until they think that they find, found a few clusters. And then you can see those clusters and you can read from the data that let's say those points, the red points, are between the age of 25 and uh, 45. And on the y-axis it says that they bought beer. On another axis, z-axis, they say that they bought pampers. Okay, then this category is aged between 25 and 45 and they buy pampers and beer, for example. For us, as people, it's very easy to see the clusters. For a machine, it's difficult, and that's why we use algorithms. 
uh, it's easy if we have two dimensions, but we can have millions of dimensions, so we cannot see them, basically. Uh, other applications, for example, in stock trading, they try to they, they try to use linear models to see how the stock the stock is varying, and the trade there are a lot of trading machines which are developed, and all the stock market is working between machines which are based on AI. Can you develop on this? You mean, you can develop. There is a Google data set. No, no. Can you? I mean, can you go more explicit about the Not stock? Code, I mean, oh, course. yeah. Uh, basically, like what exactly? What I mean, what would be the inputs and what would be the outputs? Based, uh, for example, uh, Google has uh, their stock variation online. You can train it on the model, and you will uh, get a certain mathematical function which takes as input a few input values, features which we provide, and it will have as output the stock price. That the machine will do the... I mean, yeah, the, the machine. machine yes. First, it will learn from the data. Machine learning, this is all about, uh, like machine learning, it's all about learning from past data and then trying to predict something on new data. So it will learn from past data, from the features that are specified, it depends on the data set, and then we have to uh, give that learned function new features and it will predict us the stock market. For but you don't necessarily have to give the output, right? You will get the output. Okay. This is unsupervised learning when you want to get the output. In supervised learning, as I said, you have the output and you compare your model's output with the expected output and if it's wrong, you update your model and this is the learning process. I have a question about yeah. the other type of data. About yes. What about sound and frequency? Uh, for sounds and frequencies, I didn't work with it yet, but you can also use convolutional neural networks for sound recognition, and uh, I'm not sure how they are transformed into data, but in the end, they all result into numbers. As our images resulted into numbers, uh, sound frequencies will result into numbers, how high the frequency is. Then probably you will apply some Fourier transformation on it, to see if you can find some pattern in that frequency. Then apply convolutional network on it. So numbers, it's all about <laughs> mathematics. Uh, can you please uh, put us back to the slide where we calculate the matrix from for that image? Sorry? Will you give the example with the flashlight? Yeah, the convolutional. Okay, for me, how is the Yes, so as you can see, the, the orange square, that's a filter. And that is, a, in our case, a 3x3 three three matrix, which has numbers in it, which are in the beginning randomly initialized. Yeah? They are ran it's a 3x3 three three matrix, which has random numbers in it. And then you put it to the top left corner of the image, you, mu you multiply them, for example, with one, with the one, like element, element wise. You multiply them and the add them up, you get a number. And that number will be the first number in our uh, pink square. Then you move this filter x step size, in this case it's just one, you move it one step, you do this again. You get the second number, which is a 3 in the pink square. In the field, in the initial image, you have numbers from the RGB values. On the filter, you have random numbers. And then I said about backpropagation, back during that algorithm, these random numbers from the filter will be updated because those are basically weights. So we cannot specify to the algorithm what features to look for. 
it will develop, it will calculate numbers after the, uh, the back propagation, and each filter will detect some features which it thinks it might be useful. So the numbers in the filter will also be changed over time by the algorithm. Can you make one iteration of the image, the filter remains the same? Will it change Yeah, no, no. In, in one iteration, it remains the same. It remains the same until the whole data flows through the whole network. Once we get the output, we compute the loss function, and we pass back and update all those numbers which have to be updated, including these ones from the filter. So basically, can you create like, uh, I mean, can you say like filters that detect curves or features or something like this, and then yes. you use them on different, in different algorithms or let's say in, in different configurations or in other platforms? Yes, of course. Once the filter is learned, you can test it to see what is it, what is it detecting, and there are a lot of filters named by scientists. Kalman filters are really popular for edge detection, for example. So you can name a filter after yourself if you find a really nice one and just publish it and you can reuse it anytime. So for example, let's say if I have a neural network that tries to identify, I don't know, birds, for example. Yes. Um, one of the filters will be detecting, let's say, the eye of the bird. Another filter will detect the beak of the bird. Stuff like kind of, but as I said in the beginning, in, on the first convolutional layer, we have to use small filters. So those, for example, will detect will detect half circle, a straight line, stuff like that. Then when we proceed to how to other, which one do we actually get to identify a feature? Uh, it depends on the number of convolutional layers you use, uh, but it grows it as you go deeper you will detect uh, larger and larger features. You will reach at some point an eye or something like this. But you cannot really know after which point because, for example, last year's ImageNet winner used Google, used like 156 uh, layers. So it, it was a really deep ne network and you don't really know. You have to test it and see when is it happening. So basically, one of the filters, I mean, if you want to reuse a filter in the middle of the network, you don't really, you, you can't really use it like that, unless you actually rely on all the other layers to provide you with the data necessary for that filter to actually provide you with the results. You can use that filter if you want, but it's not, I'm, you, are, you cannot be sure that it will be useful to use it right there. So you have to try it and test where it would be useful to use it. That's why I, say, I said that we cannot come up with uh, rules for detecting. We have to let the machine, because it works basically like our brains, and just let it try to detect by itself how and what. We have to focus more on parameter tuning, the filter sizes, the step sizes, and the architecture of the layer, because the other is just maths and it's working. Is there any machine learning applied on developing? more accurate neural networks? You know, like applying the machine learning principles to actually improve incrementally the accuracy of detecting or something else? Like yes, this is why this ImageNet competition is held every year and there is a data set which is classifying 1,000 categories of different images, birds, trains, 1,000 categories and they try to always improve the accuracy of this. Even though it's below 1%, they still try to improve it every year. So it's under hard research. Can we use filters in deep filters? Sorry? Can we use filters within filters? Uh, as I said, in, for example, if you use a filter, you can use more filters in, in that layer and the activation map will be a stacked activation map. And you can use that. You can use more filters in this layer, and you will not have just one activation map. You will have 
three activation maps, and that will be the input for the next layer. Yeah, so the more filters you use, the more information you can extract. The example you gave is actually applicable to uh, color images, right? Yeah, to color images, to grayscales, to... Like you have a filter for the red, you have a filter for the... Blue. No, no. Uh, I mentioned this, it's uh, a bit tricky. For example, in, in a convolutional layer, let's say you have uh, uh, an image, which is a uh, height and width and three dimensions. Then your filter have to, has to be three by three, for example, and has to have three dimensions. And in each dimension, of course, the numbers are the same. So uh, the dimension of the filter in a convolution layer has to be the same as the dimension of the input. So this is just one filter. Then you use another filter with three by three and three dimensions. That will give you another example. This example with the digits, how many filters did you have? Uh, in uh, this example, if you use Keras, it will come up with the amount of uh, amount of filters it thinks it is all right. So I didn't specify in the first layer how many filters I need. It uh, the algorithm comes up with the number of filters it wants to use. After you collected the pink matrix, what do you do with it? The pink. This is the input for the next layer. For example, the next should be a nonlinear layer. That would do if we would have somewhere a minus number there. That would be transformed to zero. zero. The others will be left like the same. That's your next, your current image basically. You give it to the next layer. You can give it to another convolutional layer, for example, and it will do the same thing. And so you shrink the matrix until we have a... Yes, usually it will shrink uh, layer by layer. But there is also a, ca an, a case when, for example, in the first layers, you don't want to shrink your image because you want to keep more information in the first layers. So you can add padding to your uh, image, which is the number of, which is basically padding of zeros. The number of layers you want to add can be calculated based on a mathematical formula, which is quite simple, I can't remember it now. So you add that padding and you perform the convolution and the resulting pe uh, pink uh, matrix will be the same size as your original image in the beginning. So this is an option if you don't want in the beginning to shrink your image. But once you apply pooling layers, it will shrink drastically. So. Uh, no. It's it's a. Uh, no, it's not supervised because you can know where it's. It's image recognition, basically. Like it, it has to identify. No, it's unsupervised, definitely, because. Okay. You know. so if I have a camera at the entrance of the door, it has to identify if it's me. Does it have, does it have to match an image, image of myself with the one that it detects? Once, uh, once that is done, that you are in the da database, then it is supervised, yes. But before that, it isn't. And what, if you're not in the database, what should it recognize? It tries to recognize you, it gives you a prediction, and usually if you deploy it to production, it gives you a prediction, and uh, usually if they want to improve their model, they will ask you, is it you? You say no, and you say your name, and it will uh, update the weights of the model, and this way, next time, it will recognize you. But if you don't have an output, then what to, what to look for? If you don't have your image in the database, then basically your software will, will give you a million ways of not being you. No, no, no. It will not look in the database. It will give uh, your image to the model. It will output something. You don't know what if you are not there yet. So you will get an output. Ah. And then it will ask you, is it you? And you will say, no, I am. And it will update the weights. This is how training works. It 
the data flows through, it gives you an output, probably it's wrong in the beginning, then it realizes it's wrong, updates the way it flows through again, realizes it is wrong, updates again. Third time it flows through, it sees that it's all right, it just goes to the next example. I, I didn't uh, do this at university, I just did it during the summer, uh, doing some research. And uh, they are doing heavy research on uh, image, on, on face recognition, for example. Or there is a, another research area, which is how they want to train these uh, image recognition models. They cannot always come up with, let's say, uh, one million images about birds. So they uh, use these generative adversarial networks, which basically try to generate artificial images based on uh, the images they have. So they, those networks try to generate as real images as possible. Once they generated it, they feed those artificial images basically to the network and train. So this is a, a field of research they are working and the other one is attaching text to images, like uh, a description of the image. For this one, they are using uh, not only convolutional neural networks, but recurrent neural networks, which uh, have kind of a memory. So they are trying, combining the two. First, they use the convolutional neural network. They have an output, which is category or more categories with, if they have more objects, and then they feed this into a recurrent neural network which tries to learn from that pattern. And in the end, they are really nice descriptions, like a cup of tea on a table, for example. So it can generate really accurate descriptions. Yes, I can show you there is a really great blog post from where I had a few images too. Yes, so Adit Deshpande, he wrote is a series of three uh, blog posts and basically he does the same, it explains how convolutional neural networks work. Once you get this, just if you read about Keras a bit, you can easily implement CNN. Or if you use Udemy courses, there you will find it's, it's called Deep Learning from A to Z. And that's a really good course on uh, deep learning. There is also machine learning A to Z. That's a course on different topic. And they are really good starting points. Yes, for example, I don't know if there is anybody from iOS development. Uh, Swift, uh, Swift now released this core ML, and so uh, they also built a few pre-trained models which you can integrate in your iOS app. And there is an image recognition model which you just download and put it in your app, and it works. I'm not sure now on which model it is based. If you want to develop it, it you saw it's not too hard to develop it in Keras. So there is always a paper of uh, image recognition architecture each year from the winners mostly. 
so you can read that paper and they will specify how exactly they stack all the layers. You can just copy it and it will Thank you.